Why would we connect David and Melchizedek? Well, we don't. David does. David brings Melchizedek into the conversation. Written thousands of years ago, every page, every story inspired from God. Do they apply to me? Is the Old Testament obsolete? With Pastor Jim Scudder Jr. Are you frustrated? You're like, yeah. You don't even want to know what I'm frustrated about. But are you frustrated when things that you get are obsolete the day you get it? And uh, you need the next one and the next one. And I thought I had the best. Well, that was yesterday. That's how it goes. But there are a lot of things in this world that are obsolete. But we're going to talk today that this is not one of them. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? That we have something so ancient and so old that it's relevant, it's alive, it's living, it's, it's powerful, it can change our lives, it can change our eternity. And so we stand without apology, we stand boldly upon this book because it's not just a book, uh, these are the very words of our Creator God. And uh, today we're going to talk more about this mysterious king, his name is Melchizedek. And who is this mysterious king? Melchizedek. I want you to, to wonder what is this mysterious object here covered by this um, black little, um, what do you call it, tablecloth? Uh, and I need a kid to help me. Is there any, are there any kids in the room that would like to come up here and try to guess what this object is? Okay, right there. Come on up. Yep, yep, you. Yep, come on up. Run. Here we go. Let's give him a hand. Here he comes. All right. Uh-oh. We have a problem. All right, you, oh, there it's revealed. You hold on to that. And I'm going to have to get a new uh, man. Do you know, or stand over there so everyone can see you. First of all, tell us your name. Jace. Jace. Can you tell me what this is? You can't read it, though. Oh, my goodness. This is really sad, isn't it? Can I see what, know what the pages look like? He wants to see inside. Okay. <gasps> we are so old, you guys. We are so old. Is it like, is it like tons of businesses? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, it's tons of businesses. Yeah. So that's what they call it. They call it a tons of businesses book. Um, we had uh, one, of, one of my best buddies growing up was uh, not as tall as the rest of us, so he got to sit on these a lot. He still, I think he still has a few that he sits on uh, to bring his... Any of you ever sit on phone books when you were little? Yeah, it's cool. It's a phone book. So a phone... <laughs> Did you know that today... In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell made the first phone call. Isn't that amazing? 148 years ago, the first phone call was made. There was one phone, and it was him calling his assistant, Mr. Watson. And he said, Mr. Watson, what, you say it if you know it. I, I need to see you. Something like that. It was really simple. It was so simple I couldn't remember it. And so his assistant came from the other room into his room, and they had made the first conversation over a wire. And it went from that to 6.5 billion smartphone users today. Isn't that amazing where we've come and all of that? So what this is, is a, it's a directory of people's phone numbers. And this one's uh, yellow pages, so yellow pages is uh, businesses, and then the white pages were people. Um, it was, I think, within two years, they had the first listing phone book, but it was only one piece of paper. New Haven, Connecticut had 50 people or businesses listed that had phones in that town. And there weren't any phone numbers, because you just pick up the phone and you say the name, and the operator connects you to that other person. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right. Phone number still active? Let's try it. Let's try it. You want to try it? No, we, 
Wait, I don't know. That would kind of be interesting, wouldn't it? So this is from 1990. That seems like yesterday. Porcelain hydraulics. So they don't have area codes. So now almost every, uh, all the numbers have area codes. So we'd have to guess at that. This is Elmhurst. Elmhurst. So it's kind of a low-rent area. No. We have staff that lived there, and they're really proud of Elmhurst. So, Okay, so is that it? Are we done? Yeah. No, we're not done. You know, you know what comes with volunteering. You get a nice $20 bill. Use that quick before that grows obsolete. Okay? Good job. I don't know why I was so bothered by that, that he didn't know what that was. I just thought, well, I'm sure he knows. So what, the, what we're trying to do here is I'm asking you to bring in something that you know what it is, but your kids or grandkids might not know what it is. And we've had a number of these. My wife, Karen, is the one who's kind of holding the stuff, so give it to her if you have something like that that we haven't already, already used. But it seems like we're not running out of things, which is really interesting. And the Bible, though, in the, in the Word of God, it says this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isn't that wonderful that this book isn't ever going to be obsolete? And, but some people say, well, the Old Testament is. Well, the Old Testament is the first part of Scripture. It's the Hebrew Scriptures. We might better call it the Older Testament. Is it relevant? Is it, is it still important? Should we know what it says? I, 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 I want to say this. There are some preachers that have said it's not relevant. It's not important. You don't need to read it. You don't need to really study it. You don't need to know it. But I, I say if we don't know it, we don't know a lot of stuff that the New Testament mentions. I think it's foundational. It's important that we know what it is. So that's what this study is. It's a, a look through the Old Testament. We're not going to hit on every last story, but we're going to hit on all the important ones. And uh, today we're going to land once again on an important passage. Uh, in Hebrews, several places, but uh, in chapter 7 especially, it talks about a person named Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Melchi is king. Zedek is righteousness. And it also says king of Salem. So not only is he the king of righteousness, he's the king of uh, shalom, of peace. And when you say Jerusalem, you're saying the city of peace, the, 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 the city where Melchizedek was the king, but he was also the priest of the Most High. Being, first being, by interpretation, king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Isn't that wonderful when the Bible interprets itself and helps us get deeper meaning? In verse 3 of Hebrews 7, the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, says this, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, made like unto the Son of God, abidest a priest continually. And some people have looked at that and said, then this mysterious person that we learned about in Genesis must be a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. It's called a Christophany. So is that what this is? And this has been debated, and I'm going to wade into a, a debated topic, which isn't always the wisest thing to do, but I'll have an opinion on this, and I, I feel that this is not a theophany or Christophany. I believe that this was a real person, a king, back in the day of Abraham. He was the king of a Jebusite city, so we would think that he would be a Canaanite, that part of the, the group of, of people that live there in Canaan. Although Jewish tradition and extra biblical writings have quite a bit to say about Melchizedek. I'm not going to go there. The reason is because we have to be careful to ever, when we go outside the Bible, and we start to read what other people say that, aren't, that it isn't inspired, that's where we can go off track pretty quickly. We do know that he appears in Genesis, and then he disappears. So it's as, as if he comes from nowhere and, and 
doesn't go anywhere. He, we don't read about him having a father or a mother or, or uh, descendants or uh, any of this. Here's what I think it is. I think it's simply this. He is a, a king that was a believer in the one true God, which was a rarity at that time after Babel and after the flood. There was only a few people, and he was one of them. But he was a, a one in whom would be a, a type or a model of Jesus that would come later. How do we know that? Well, we're going to get into that today and explain that. But first, we have so far in the series started at the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and we have a, a creation in six literal days. Six days he created, the seventh day he rested, giving us a model to follow. We also learn that we were made in his image, and from that we get a lot of important uh, truths on how to live today. So when we have someone that is physically handicapped, mentally handicapped, uh, really, really old, with Alzheimer's, we, we don't euthanize them, Right? Why? Because we're made in the image of God. We, we, we are not animals. We didn't come from animals. We are made different. We are made unique. There has to be a, a, a supreme value put upon that life. We also know that that would apply to the unborn. And how do we know when that person is a person? Well, we have to go back to the beginning of that person, which is conception. We have to. There's been a big debate on the in vitro fertilization and, and the techniques that are used. And I've looked into it, and I think that if as long as the uh, sperm and egg aren't united, then and once they're united, I think that is a soul, that is a person, even if it's outside the uterus. So there are techniques that can do that without, uh, it just one at a time and do it that way. Uh, I believe that that's okay, but we have to be thoughtful about this. We have to be careful about this. Why? Because we're made in God's image. God made us for a reason. He didn't just plop us down in the Garden of Eden and we just kind of do our own thing. He made us for a purpose. He made us for a reason. What was that reason? The reason was to be his representatives on this earth. That was our first calling, to represent the earth to God, to represent God to the earth and to all those that would inhabit the earth. What happened? Well, we weren't satisfied with being representatives of God. We wanted to be God. And the serpent came, the devil himself, tempting Eve. Adam also fell in this temptation, and they rebelled and they sinned. And then that just entered into the world so many, really all of our problems. Okay? So this is, this is the story of, of Scripture. This is the story that God tells us of how we came. And then there was a promise right away of a Savior, of a Messiah, to redeem us, some that, one that would come, that would be one of us, a, a seed of the woman. And then we come to the story of man's wickedness, the destruction of the world by a global flood, which we find evidence for that, and God saving one family, Noah and his family. And from that, we go to the Tower of Babel, the division of languages, and we still see the nation groups lining up with what the Bible has to say. It all fits scientifically into what God says. Then we find a selection of a family, one man, Abram, his name would later be Abraham, we're still calling him Abram in our scriptures that we're studying today, but we'll call him Abraham, because that's what we all know him as. And he came to bring us the Messiah. God chose him, not because he was a, a certain kind of a person, he was always gonna do right, because he didn't always do right, but he did believe God. Before circumcision, before the dietary laws, before keeping the feasts, where, where a lot of Jewish people think that, that think that they're saved by those things, before any of that, he was justified. He was declared righteous by God. How? He believed God. What did he believe? He believed that God was going to bring the Messiah, the promised one. And then he came into this land of Canaan. God said, I'm going to give you this land forever, all of it. And uh, he brought his nephew Lot. Last time we learned that Lot had gone toward Sodom to graze his flocks, eventually living in Sodom, was taken captive 
into uh, the, by the kings of the north. Here's a map of the Middle East, of Israel, and uh, we, we know that Abraham would have been just north of Jerusalem. We also know that he would have been just south of Jerusalem in Hebron. But we know when they divided, they divided just north of Jerusalem by Bethel, and a lot went into this area, which we called the Kikar, uh, the, uh, the plain of Jordan. And that's where some believe Sodom was, other believe Sodom is south. We're going to talk more about that later, the destruction of so- Sodom. But they were captured by kings of Mesopotamia that had come down and attacked, and they were being brought back up to Mesopotamia, Lot and his family and others. And Abraham mounted a rescue party with his men, and against great odds went and took Lot back and all the people and all the things. He comes back to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, he is met by uh, two kings. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit again today, the contrast between the two, the two kings. But let's, let's start going back into our study a little bit in Genesis 14, and let's look at verse 16. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return. Remember the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah went and hid. What, what great leaders, right, would go and hide as their people and their cities were being ransacked. Um, to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Ketalomar and the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, so this is the contrast. You have the king of Sodom and you have Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. We saw the contrast last time of uh, the one that would come after Melchizedek from his line, from his order, and he would also bring bread and juice for us to remember what he did on the cross. And he was the priest of the Most High. Isn't that interesting? That's really all we know about Melchizedek, this and uh, a few verses later. So we have King of Sodom. Sodom was a wicked city. Likely he was a wicked man. We know, we know he wasn't a good leader if he's going to w- run and hide in a cave while his people are being destroyed. And then we have the contrasting righteous king, uh, king of peace, king of Salem, the the priest of the Most High. His name means king of righteousness. Amazing contrast. In verse 19, and he blessed him and said, this is Melchizedek blessing Abram, blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, the one true God. There's one God. There's one God. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. So Melchizedek's also crediting Abraham's success in the fact that Abraham was trusting the Lord to help him and vastly outnumbered. You know, we had these four kings that were powerful enough to destroy five cities, capture five cities, and uh, just a little over 100 men went and saved Lot and his family. So Melchizedek says this is God's work. And then Abram gave tithes of all. We talked about tithing last week and how important it is, I think, even for today. And I hope that that was an impactful message uh, to you. We announced a need of $15,000 for one of our missionaries in Africa. And that need was met within a day of either money coming in or a commitment to money. And so I believe this is the most generous church. I really do. And I think that's what God wants and God delights in that. And I hope all of us learn generosity. I really do. God is a giver and we need to be givers to reflect him well. Now, last time I played a short video, an ingrace video of us going into a place in the city of David, which is in Jerusalem. This is where Jerusalem started. So if you're looking at the very beginning of Jerusalem, it's the city of David. And we went into a little enclosed area, locked area, and I'm going to play another clip from a different series, but it's about the same spot. The first time I went in there, I went in there with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. Dr. Stripling had been given a tour of this place by Ellie Shukran, 
who's the archaeologist that discovered a lot of these things there in the city of David, including the Pool of Siloam. Dr. Baugh dug with Eli Shukran. You saw him last time on that clip of a different series. But this was the first time I went into this area. It's an area very near the Gihon Spring. The Gihon Spring was the water source for Jerusalem, the only water source. And they had built a, a wall around that. And uh, it's really interesting. So I want, you, I want to play this clip for you of Scott Stripling and I, my first experience going into this place, which I believe there's archaeological evidence that it is the, the tabernacle of David, but also one that David mentions in Psalms, Melchizedek's altar. We know Melchizedek was a priest at the time of Abraham, and they found pottery dating back to Abraham in this same area. Okay, so watch this video. Now for what we've all been waiting for. The public can't see what we're about to see. Could this be a place that King David worshiped and Melchizedek before him? Okay, well, now we're going to get access to something that almost no one has seen. Well, this is called Discover Hidden Israel, Scott, <laughs> so we're going well, behind closed doors. This is a temple precinct area that dates certainly to the time of David. In fact, David's tabernacle may have been pitched here, just above the Gihon Spring, and it may even date back to Melchizedek. What? King okay. and priest of righteousness. Check it out. Okay, this is our first stop. So Jim, you've seen olive presses over the last couple of weeks. We've looked at a bunch of them. And so you recognize where the beam would go. The wooden beam goes in here and there's weights that pull down on the beam and it's squeezing the baskets that have the olive oil, squeezing out the oil here. So there's nothing unique about it, except the fact that there's only one and except that it's right next to the Gihon Spring and that it's next to cultic installations or ritual installations, worship installations, which we have many examples of that here, of olive oil being produced for holy purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's right next to the temple. It can't be impure. In other words, it's produced and then it's used. Mm -hmm. So that's the holy anointing oil, for example. Solomon is anointed just above the Gihon Spring, and we are about 25 feet above the Gihon Spring right now. What oil might they, may they have been using? This becomes very, very interesting. But that would also mean that we're in the vicinity of where the Ark of the Covenant would have stood. Well, this is exactly right. Uh, 1 Kings 32 says that as David is dying, he gives instructions to have Solomon placed on his donkey and brought down to the Gihon Spring so that he could be anointed here. Uh, and they took the oil from David's tabernacle. So we know that the tabernacle was at Shiloh for over three centuries. Once it was recaptured from the Philistines, it was at Kiriath Jerim, and then David brought it to the city of David. Now, 1 Kings 32 says that the tabernacle of David was right adjacent to the Gihon Spring. Now, here we are just above the Gihon Spring, and we're finding these very interesting installations. So we may, in fact, be standing at the site of David's tabernacle. Oh, man, Scott. All right, we're moving to the second room, Jim, in this temple complex. Mm -hmm. It's what we would call a temenos, or a sacred precinct. And you can see, of course, carved into bedrock, some interesting features. Uh, this channel running out here, it has to have significance, sure. right? And gravity would bring whatever was here mm -hmm. down into that channel. Now, we have no way of knowing exactly what was there. Some thought is that this was a sacrificial altar. So you have, if there's an animal sacrifice involved on Mount Moriah, very interesting. So Melchizedek, for example, was the king and priest of Jerusalem. So perhaps an, an animal sacrifice took place here and there was a, a fire that, that went up. But I'll give you another interesting possibility in the time of David. I measured this and the Bible gives us the exact dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And you have that quadrangular indentation on top of the Dome of the Rock where we can say, clearly the Ark of the Covenant sat here. This is almost exactly, it's just a slight overlap of where the Ark of the Covenant might sit as well. Mm. So this is the second aspect of the Timonos. We have the oil press here, making the sacred olive oil, perhaps the sacrificial area here, perhaps even the Ark of the Covenant there, 
Tabernacle of David pitched over this, and then we move into the third section. Okay. So next stop, Scott. Okay, we're moving now into the center of the temple, which the fact that it's in the geometric center could be significant. And Jim, when it's locked, what does that tell you? <laughs> There's something valuable. It's interesting, that's right, yeah, it's valuable. Exactly. So go ahead and unlock it. It's nice to have the key. And then as we op open this, you can get a look. This is a clear example of a standing stone. So if you had sacred oil, one of the things you might do with that oil is what? Pour it on them. Like Jacob did at Bethel. He anointed it, and what did he say? This is the house of God. Now, where do we think we might be? Mm -hmm. In David's tabernacle. Behold the house of God. Okay, Jim, we're now moving to the fourth aspect of this temple area, the sacred precinct and you're looking at some enigmatic carvings in bedrock. Now, no doubt they're man-made, mm -hmm. okay? So the question is, what do they represent? So there's lots of theories, but one that is prevailing is that there were stands, wooden stands that fit down into these, mm -hmm. and that this is where animal sacrifice was performed. So we're now looking at this in terms of the production of olive oil, mm -hmm. and then either sacrifice or a placement of the Ark of the Covenant there, and then the sacred stone, the Maseva in the center, and now we come to the place of animal sacrifice. So all the aspects that are involved in worship of, of Yahweh. So again, we're not sure of all of this, but the proximity to obviously uh, David's palace very close by there, and all of the details. So why would we connect David and Melchizedek? Well, we don't. David does. David does. So, you know, if it weren't for David and the author of Hebrews, we probably wouldn't think a whole lot more about Melchizedek. But David brings Psalm 110 into the equation. Look at Psalm 110 with me. It is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. It is a significant portion of of scripture. David brings Melchizedek into the conversation. Remember, if David was worshiping in the same place that Melchizedek was worshiping, you see the, you see the connection point there? And David says in Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord. Now on your notes and on the screen, I included the, the uh, transliteration the Hebrew and the English translation of Lord. When you see Lord all in caps in your Bible, it is the, the name of God that doesn't have vowels. And so people, some people say Yahweh. Um, I believe it's probably Jehovah, Yehovah. Um, either way, this is the Lord. This is the Lord God. This is for sure the, the Father, God the Father. Said, uh, David says, the Lord, Jehovah, says unto my Lord, so when anytime you see capital L, O-R-D, a small O-R-D, that's Adonai. I know this is a little confusing, but trying to help you understand the Hebrew in your English Bible. Um, this is, I believe, the, who, who would my Lord, if David says, the Lord says unto my Lord, who would my Lord be? Who is Adonai? I think he's talking about... He, David is the king of Israel. There's no one else of higher authority in his kingdom. He's it. He's the king. So if he says, my Lord, he has to be talking about someone that's his descendant. We'll talk about that in a second. He's talking about someone coming after him that he would call my Lord. That would be above him. So who could be above him? Well, that's where Jesus comes in. David says, prophetically, sit thou, this is Adonai, Adonai, sit thou at my right hand. The Lord God, the Father, is saying to 
David's Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Was there ever a king of Israel that had every enemy under subjection in the world? No, absolutely not. Even today, Israel has enemies. They have not vanquished every enemy. But there is a day when a king from Israel, a descendant of David, will have every enemy under his feet uh, in subjection. We'll skip to verse 4. The other two verses are important, but for sake of time, we're going to focus on this one. This is David bringing Melchizedek back in. If David is worshiping at the same altar that Melchizedek was worshiping in, it's really incredible. David says, the Lord, Yahweh, has uh, sworn and will not repent. So God has said this, this Adonai, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek comes back into the scene hundreds and hundreds of years later. David brings him up prophetically that this Messiah, this promised one, the Adonai, the Lord of David, would be a priest. Not after the Levitical priesthood, which was the priesthood that God set up from the Jewish people, the descendants of Levi, and Aaron being a a Levite was the high priest, the first high priest, but the the, the priesthood that God set up for Israel failed multiple times. Even Aaron, who would be the first high priest, as God was giving the law, the Ten Commandments, broke the first commandment by making the golden calf. Think throughout the history of the priests. Um, How about Eli, who was a a good high priest, but his sons were not. They were corrupt. Think about the time of Jesus. The high priesthood was basically appointed by Rome. It was another corrupt priesthood. So the priesthood that God intended to represent God to earth didn't do a good job, did they? So one is going to come outside the order of the Levites. He would come after a different order the order of Melchizedek as it was prophesied. So these are really incredible things, I think, and let's talk more about that. First, let's talk more about the location. David, here is the king of Jerusalem. Here's an image, a a modern image looking down upon Jerusalem. You can easily see the Temple Mount here and the Dome of the Rock standing right in the middle of it. That would be the Temple of Solomon. David was not allowed to build the temple. David, though, did purchase the land, right? But now, there's a section of the city that goes down and around, and this is the Kidron Valley here, and that, that, this right here is the city of David. This, I believe, is the city that Melchizedek was the king of. Many years later, David brought the head of Goliath to this same place. Isn't that interesting? Why? Well, I think he knew that one day he was going to take this city for himself, and he was going to show the inhabitants of Jebus, Jebus, uh, of Salem, that uh, he had just killed the biggest guy ever. Uh, Goliath is a picture of the devil, a picture of Satan. Goliath would have been dressed in scales. He had the metal armor on. He would have had the hat of Dagon. He would have looked like the fish god. And here we have a little shepherd boy, David, representing his god, the Lord is my shepherd, killing this giant, bringing the head into the city that he would uh, one day, once he was king, take over. So this is where we were filming just right in this area here. This is the Gihon Spring. It was fortified, and they can still see those fortifications all the way, by the way, uh, through the time of Hezekiah. This was all, and it's being dug extensively. The Pool of Siloam is here at the bottom. You remember that in Jesus' day. It's incredible what they're finding. Here's another image that might give you a better vision of what it would look like without all the modern structures, the Gihon Spring being there uh, just uh, to the east of the city. And, um, and up here, later on in, in uh, Solomon's day, they would have built the temple at the very top of Mount Moriah. But this is an extension of the same hill. So do you remember, Abraham brought Isaac to where? To Mount Moriah. 
Another picture of a willing sacrifice, the son being a willing sacrifice. And there was a way that David was able to uh, have one of his men sneak in. There was a little, I think there was a little place that a person could slide into the fortifications. David, being a shepherd on these hills, probably one day spotted someone coming out. So he knew there was a way into the city, and sure enough, when it came time for David to take the city, uh, there was one of his men went in, I believe, right through that same area, and once they, he was inside, they gave up. They gave up, and they said, okay, the city's yours. We don't see a destruction of the city. We don't see them killing the people. As a matter of fact, David bought the threshing floor from a Jebusite. So we know that there was a, probably a somewhat of a friendship there already, but now this is Israel's capital for forever. And then David brought the Ark of the Covenant, again, right above the Gihon Spring. This is where we were filming. Uh, right there, the Ark of the Covenant was there. David worshiped there. And then Solomon brought the Ark of the Covenant up onto the temple area. I just love how all of these things connect. Now, why wouldn't David be the royal priest? Why wouldn't David be able to be the representative of God on this earth? Well, because David was, like you and I, a sinner. David sinned. David failed the Lord, just like Abraham had failed the Lord, just like Moses failed the Lord, just like Aaron failed the Lord. So David says, one of my descendants will be the priest king like Melchizedek. That priesthood is older than Israel's priesthood, obviously. The perfect royal priest will restore the failed priesthood. And this is all going to connect to you and me in just a second, if you all are patient. Are you all patient? Okay. You said no. Now let's fast forward to the time of Jesus. From David would eventually come Jesus. He was of the house and lineage of David. Both his parents, by the way, were descendants of David. Joseph, his legal father. Mary, his biological mother. And we have in Luke 3, 22, the Holy Ghost. Jesus is at his baptism. Some have likened it to his ordination as a priest. Jesus goes down under the water by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water, and the Bible says the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove, Upon him and a voice from heaven, so you have the Spirit, you have the Father, which said, Thou art my beloved Son. You have the Son. In thee I am well pleased. From this point on, Jesus, the beloved Son, Psalm 2 6 says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And seven, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This doesn't mean that Jesus was only the son when he was born. He was always the son. But this is the idea of a, a unique, a one of a kind. Just like in John 3, um, Jesus says that he was the only begotten son, the one of a kind, monogenes of the father. Okay? So we have the son. Jesus at his baptism is being, I believe, ordained as a priest, but he wasn't from the right order. He was of the house of David. David wasn't from the priestly order. So he was operating as a priest. Think about all the things that Jesus was doing. He was restoring people who were impure. He was forgiving sins. These were jobs of the priests, but he was doing this outside of the priest's authority. No wonder they were so upset at Jesus. They were mad, especially when he cleansed the temple twice. They, Jesus said they had made his house the den of thieves. He did it early in his ministry. He did it late in his ministry. And when they were questioning him, like, who, who gave you the authority to, to do these things, to act like a priest outside the priestly authority? What does Jesus do? In Matthew twenty two forty one, 41, this is very interesting. This is how it all ties back together with Psalm 110 and Melchizedek in Genesis. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Remember this word Christ is the word Messiah. 
promised one, anointed one. So Jesus is saying, what do you think about this promised one? Whose son is he? They said unto him, the son of David. I loved it when Jesus was, uh, he, would, he would talk and he would, he would ask them questions that they had no answer for. Really silenced them. He said unto them, so he made them admit that the Messiah would be the son of David because they knew that in the scriptures. And so Jesus said unto them, these are the religious, the, the priesthood that should have been doing their job, representing God on the earth, representing the earth to God, the connection between God and man. They had failed, and Jesus was doing what they couldn't do as the priest. And now he is saying, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord? saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He's quoting David, Psalm 110. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? You see the conundrum that they were in? If he's David's Lord, how could he also be David's son? There's only one answer for that, and that is the incarnation. The incarnation is the only answer for that, meaning Jesus was the Lord of David, also the son of David. And no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I tell you what, you want to you have good answers? Just know the Bible. That's all you have to do. Know the Bible, and you'll have really good answers for people. Now let's look at a little bit later, when Jesus was under arrest, now he's being tried by the high priest. The corrupt Caiaphas, Jesus held his peace. And the high priest, Caiaphas, corrupt, answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ. Okay? The promised one, the anointed one. Are you the, do you say you're the, the Christ, the son of God? So Caiaphas is asking this to Jesus. What does Jesus say? Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said. <laughs> Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, sitting at the right hand of power. Remember Psalm 110. This Son of David that David calls Lord is going to be sitting at the Father's right hand. And he's saying, you're going to see this Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And that's exactly what we are waiting for. The Lord's return. He's at the right hand right now. Again, Psalm 110, 1, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jesus is connecting the dots back to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is connecting the dots back to Melchizedek in Genesis. Now, how does this affect me? How does this, what, what will this do for me tomorrow on Monday? We go back to Hebrews. Hebrews is connecting all of this for us. It's a big circle. Seeing then we have a great high priest. Who is this? This is Yeshua. This is Jesus. He is the royal priest, the great high priest, the great king priest that has passed into the heavens because he ascended, right? He ascended up into heaven. He's coming back to that very place. Jesus, the son of God. There it is. He's the son of God. He's someone David would call Lord. He's also David's son of the flesh, but he is God in the flesh. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. What does that mean? That means simply this. Jesus was faced with every trial and temptation that you or I will ever be faced with. And he passed every test. So don't say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. You, you have no idea how hard this is. Oh, yes, he does. Because you have a great high priest that has experienced all of these things. And he did what we couldn't do. He passed the test every time. How do we know? It says, was, all, was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Now he's at the right hand of God right now. We are to pray, not to a priest. We're not to go to a priest. We're going directly to the throne of God in heaven. Let us come, therefore, Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that a wonderful truth? We don't practice this, but we can and we should. And the more we do it, the more success you're going to have overcoming your trials and temptations in life because you have an advocate in heaven that has faced everything that you're going to face. Our great high priest, the son, the, the physical descendant of David through Mary, but the God of all glory came into this world in the incarnation. Now, but again, you say, how does this affect me? Hmm. Let's go back to the phone book. Our, our, our obsolete item today is the phone book. If God called you, if God called you, you are a, someone that has said, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. I have trusted in him. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven. But if Jesus called you, and he doesn't need a phone book, by the way, to call you, what would he say? Here's what he would say. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a royal priesthood. These are, th this is the church. These are people that have put their trust in Jesus, the great high priest, not of the order of the, the Levites or Aaron, but of the order of Melchizedek, a mysterious king priest of Abraham's day that didn't seem to have a beginning or an end. It just kind of came out of nowhere. But Jesus didn't have a beginning nor an end. He didn't come out of nowhere, but he came out of heaven, and he did what we couldn't do. And now those that have believed in him, we are a royal priesthood. Why? Because when we put our trust in him, we are in him. And he's in us. How? Because of the Holy Ghost that indwells every believer. The Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus died, the temple veil was torn. There's no longer any barrier between us and God because of Jesus. We are the temple. We are the royal priesthood. We are, we are now able to accomplish God's original plan on this planet. Before sin and before rebellion, as believers that are part of the royal priesthood, we now can, it says to be a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What does that mean? Well, think about the priests for a second of Israel. In the Old Testament, the priests would sing and play music of God's goodness and God's love. I recently interviewed a man who is of the Levitical line, and he's a musician, and he writes and sings beautiful songs, and he's, he wants to do it all relating to the temple worship. And it was wonderful to meet him and to, to interview him. But as royal priests, we are given the responsibility to sing songs of praise to the Lord. We did it today in this service. We're going to do it again soon in this service. This is part of our royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, the priests would give all to God through sacrifices and gifts to him. And we, as royal priests, are to give ourselves a living sacrifice. We're to serve each other. We're to be God's representative on this earth until he comes back. Until he comes back. And we're to represent the earth to God. In the Old Testament, priests would intercede for other people with prayers and blessings. And as royal priests, we're to pray and bless each other, aren't we? Do you see how this all connects to our life today? In the Old Testament, priests would serve in the temple. But as royal priests, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Until the royal priest, the great high priest, returns, we, his royal priesthood, are to represent him and do his work on this earth. And then, when he comes back, we are going to forever rule and reign with him, restoring the original intent of God as representatives 
between heaven and earth. We have an awesome responsibility, don't we? And we've been empowered by God himself to do these things, to represent him well. And I hope that we are each day walking in the spirit, allowing him to work through us in the lives of other people to be a royal priesthood. Do you know that you are a royal priest? Do you, are you positive that you're part of this chosen generation, this holy nation, this peculiar people? Well, the entrance into this group of people, this royal priesthood, is simple. It's not by anything you can do. It's not by works. It's not by offering sacrifices. It's not by singing praises or you know, being a living sacrifice. It is accepting the perfect sacrifice that God already made for you on the cross. The one he promised Adam and Eve, the one that he reiterated in the, the, the Ark of Noah, the, the Ark of Salvation, Jesus being the Ark of Salvation, the one in whom Abraham uh, represented as he was willing to offer Isaac his only son, and then God stopping him and providing himself a sacrifice. The one in whom David was worshiping in Jerusalem and pointing toward, it all comes back to the son of David, the one that David called Lord. His name is Jesus. And Jesus said, to a religious man, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's salvation. That's the gospel. All you have to do is understand that Jesus died for your sins on a cross and rose again. He is the promised one. He is the anointed one. He's the king of all glory. He's the priest that was also the sacrifice. And he died a willing sacrifice because he loves you. Has God chosen me? Yeah, God chose everyone. The, the, the offer of salvation, the, the blood of Jesus, uh, of his perfect sacrifice was spilled for every human. Now, not every human will accept that, but God has chosen you to save you if you'll just believe in him, if you'll just accept the pardon that he's already given you. Just accept that. How? By faith. You say, Lord, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that you rose again the third day. I trust in you now. And it's not a prayer that saves you. It's not a person that saves you. Unless you would say Jesus, of course, is a person. It's not a, a priest that saves you. It is the person and work of Jesus that saves you. And you're trusting in him. And if you do that, the Bible says you pass from death unto life. You are now a royal priesthood. We're now bringing back the original plan of God on this planet. We're still living in a corrupt world. We're still living in a sin-cursed world. But one day that'll all go away too, and we'll continue to rule and reign with Christ. But that's why we're here today. You are a royal priest. You can turn to the person you're sitting with and say, I am a royal priest. You can turn to that same person and say, you are a royal priest. You can do that if they're born again. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. We're royal, royal priests. And let's represent the Lord well. Do you know him? Have you put your faith in him? The Bible says that we're all sinners. You and me have sinned. We can't get rid of our sin ourselves. Jesus came and paid that perfect sacrifice. He was like us in every way, but he never sinned. He was without sin. He didn't have the sin nature. He wasn't born of a father, human father, so he didn't have the sin nature. But he died and paid for our sins, just like Isaac, the beloved son, the only son. Jesus, the only son, the beloved son, died. And he says, if you'll trust in me, you'll have everlasting life. Isn't that great?